Hello, my name is Daniel de Andrade Lima and I am a PhD candidate at Universidade Federal de Pernambuco, in Brazil. I am currently developing a thesis project regarding relations between voices and gestures in mediatic culture by investigating dubbed performances. In this specific presentation, called Brutal Dexterity and Intimate Voices in Cinematic Action Scenes, Bodies on the Edges of Intelligibility, I am invested in understanding how cinematic practices are vastly choreographic and how the use of intimate vocal modes may complexify how we understand regulations at play in cinematic bodies, and this has to do with some practice of dubbing. First, I would like to introduce my discussion through the description of one specific filmic performance. In Luca Guadagnino's Suspiria, the protagonist, Suzy, becomes part of a dance company ran by a coven of witches. She is played by North American actress Dakota Johnson and by her dance double Tanya Marin, who is officially credited only as Johnson's dance instructor. In most dance scenes, a complex editing creates the characters dancing by mixing takes from both performers. What we hear in such scenes is what interests me the most. While Susie dances, we are able to listen to what seems to be Dakota Johnson's vocal sounds. She sighs, loudly inhale and exhale, and sometimes moans a little bit. These sounds are often accompanied by exaggerated noises of stomping, gliding and cutting the air with urgent gestures. Her vocal sounds are breathy and sometimes they vibrate her vocal folds, letting me hear a glimpse of what we might recognize as her voice. These sounds appear to claim not only her movements, but her doubles as well. This way, Johnson's almost unintelligible voice, captured through sensible microphones, seems to be important to connect the different performances that create the character Susie in Suspiria. What I intend to draw from Suspiria's dances is how they can be connected to a very diffuse practice in action scenes, where an actor's performance comes together with gestures performed by a dance double or by a stunt double to create one cinematic body. In this process, it is common for voice to play a major part. Such voices are always at risk of being unintelligible, while, as argued Brenda Labelle, they also communicate the struggle of a body to become a subject. When discussing cinema's bodies, Stephen Shaviru wisely posits that it is important to understand cinema as a body itself. By doing so, he is interested in how filmic mediums can produce effectivities, understanding that it is in the flesh where the political becomes personal. To discuss body in cinema this way involves understanding affective processes that are at play in the aesthetic encounter. In Shavira's analysis, he seems to pay special attention to editing, framing and cutting, positing how montage organizes in very varied ways in constant and immanent appearances. This way, engaging to a dance scene in Suspiria, for example, is to be fascinated by a very cinematic dance that can only exist by the assemblage of different performances. Part of my interest in action and dance scenes is based on the idea that such scenes underline cinematic artifices that are operationalized by choreographic understandings of body and subject production. As Susan Foster posits when discussing choreographies of gender, after all, to discuss choreographies is to discuss how regulations are transmitted, updated, overcame, negotiated and performed bodily. A choreographic sense of subjection has to do then not only with the symbolic aspect of a gesture, but also with its kinesthetic properties. Aaron Anderson, who works as a fight coordinator, has argued how fight action scenes relate to the experience of dance, by the way they provoke kinetic sensations while they also develop characters through movement. The way each person evades, attacks or protects another person, for example, communicates something about how she deals with others and her environments. In cinema scenes, of course, this construction has to do with how specific movements are created through the cinematic medium. We might understand, this way, that cinema is itself choreographic, as Juan Bernardo Pineda Perez has argued when investigating how filmic techniques used in action and then scenes draw from shared knowledge with dance medical and military practices. 
In this sense, watching films is to be kinesthetically informed by not only some artist's movement on film, but by the very movement of film. This is a process that Erin Brannigan understands through a theory of gestural exchange, positing how the spectator's body is informed through kinesthesia. In Suspiria's choreographic project, the mixing between Tanya Martin and Dakota Johnson seems to highlight the sensation that Susie, who is innocent and supposedly untrained, transforms herself in dancing. While it is not possible to know precisely when we are watching Martin or Johnson perform, it is noticeably clear that some postures are more aggressive and some gestures more precise and stronger than others. Suspidious choreographies are, of course, very gendered, not in the sense that they are stereotypical or hegemonically feminine, but in the sense that the all-female cast of dancers is highly developed through dance scenes, and, along with these scenes, the way each character deals with gender and sexuality is also presented through dancing. By mixing some Johnson's gestures with Martin's, Susie is, then, played as a complex character that shows varied qualities of movements and different postures that relate to different ways of performing womanhood. Of course, it is important to acknowledge that vocal sounds are also gestural. In fact, Brandon LaBelle dubs voice as being not only gestural, but more specifically choreographic. This way, we can understand that developing vocal sounds involves negotiating with social regulations in a way that it has to do with subject production. Stephen Connor, when discussing voice, specifically addresses the kinetic sensations that are related with vocal production and with listening, so that listening to voices also inform us gesturally. Even when vocal sounds are not coded or are not easy to apprehend, they are still able to transmit different bodily states from a subject in action. It is interesting, though, that some of the vocal sounds we hear in action or dance scenes are on the edges of being vocal, in the sense that they are largely related with different modes of breathing. Breath is voice's ground zero, but while it projects one vital existence, it also often takes a subject to the limits of recognition. It is difficult, after all, to distinguish one person from the other by breathing sounds alone. Drawing from Davina Quinlivan and Laura Marx, Rodrigo Carreiro argues that breathing highlights voices' non-semantic properties, conducting many film scenes through effective narratives. Breathing projects specific bodily rhythms and it's only audible if captured through intimate technologies, guiding us to a very physical and haptic mode of listening. It is important to acknowledge, in this sense, that the vocal modes present in action and dance scenes are articulated with performative traditions that were developed in relation to specific audio technologies. These traditions are often gendered and racialized and interact with the ways bodies are regulated and recognized widely. Liz Green, for example, in her paper on women's voice in Hollywood cinema, argues how intimate vocals have been closely related with sexist portraits of white womanhood. In both action and dance scenes, intimate vocal modes are frequently associated with very expensive visible gestures. By performing different vocal gestures, Dakota Johnson's voice seems to conduct us through a very bodily narrative of dancing, projecting varied physical states that are articulated with the gestures we see. At the same time, and this happens in many action scenes, there is always a risk that the intimacy of those vocals become incoherent with the brutal gestures we see on the screen. This is potentialized due to those sounds being as loud as other sounds that highlight the visible gestural excess, such as noises of stomping and spinning. Sometimes, it can become clear that a stunt double is on screen, or that the body we see and hear is an assemblage of different technologies and performances. The voices we hear and the gestures we see, after all, were produced in different moments and processed and played through different technologies. These audio or image technologies present specific performative traditions that assemble varied ways of producing gendered and racialized bodies. This way, these bodies are always very regulated, and when they are put at risk in the aesthetic encounter, 
these regulations might become exposed in cinema. To sum up, at the same time, effect in action scenes depends on our ability to be fascinated by very cinematic audiovisual bodies. I believe such scenes appear as moments in which the ways bodies are produced in cinema might be highlighted. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your comments.